Greetings to all of you. My name is Rania Elisawi. I work with UNICEF. I'm based in New York headquarters, and I work on social behavior change and community engagement. It's my pleasure to be part of this capacity building initiative and to contribute to the community engagement learning package. In this module, I'll, I will be speaking about community engagement as a driver for achieving health equity and community resilience. In this presentation, there are three sections. The first section, we'll, we'll talk about the community and different constructs of the community. The second section will be an introduction to community engagement standards. And section three, we will consider the need for integration of community engagement within health systems. So let's get right into it. And let me thank you for your time and interest in this very strategic and significant pillar of health systems, which focuses on quality and intentional community engagement. As I mentioned, um, let's begin with talking about the different constructs about community. Often community is referred to within specific contexts and depending on who is defining and who's identifying the community, what their intentions and what the interests are and what we're aiming to achieve. So sometimes we refer to the community as uh, the target or recipient of an intervention or the setting of an intervention. Sometimes community is also considered from a service provider perspective or service user perspective. And also oftentimes we refer to communities as a resource. Depending on the constructs, there is a need um, for us to understand the community more broadly, the different dynamics of power, leadership, representation that influence decision-making as well as responsibilities and agency. And it's very important to understand that often all of these constructs constructs are very interrelated. So it's really important for us to understand that there are concepts around community engagement and social mobilization, but what really enables us um, to build it into our programs and to consider the evidence around it so that we can develop appropriate interventions, whether we're talking about development or humanitarian or emergency contexts. Understanding triggers for actions. What are the motivations um, of communities to step up and take actions? Um, and realizing that they are often taking actions without any support. Uh, how do the process of collective efficacy at community level evolve? And also having a full understanding um, that during public health emergency response, we also need to be able to be agile and evolve with communities as their needs also change um, and to also support their actions. And being able to understand the multiple levels of engagement is very important. Um, considering social, institutional, environmental factors, um, and that determines the evolution as well as the adoption of behaviors and how to, to leverage our strategic entry points that could enable action. So a people-centered agenda is critical for sustainable outcomes, and sustainability is centered in a rights-based approach where roles and understanding of right holders and duty bearers are clear. What this actually translates into is uh, clarity about individual and shared accountability. Ensuring that people at all levels within society have shared accountability enables stakeholders to contribute individually as well as collectively. And that is centered around three core um, components, we can say, uh, investing in strengthening governance structures, um, ensuring that development programs are risk-informed, which will contribute to better preparedness and response in the events of crises, building resilience of communities over time. And thirdly, when we think about community engagement and prioritize it, um, we engage communities through their most trusted and influential existing platforms to ensure their participation and representation of the most marginalized, disadvantaged, or underserved communities, and realize that these relationships are built as well as maintained over time. Section two, we're going to talk about the community engagement minimum standards. To start with an overview, overview about the standards, the community engagement minimum standards and indicators were developed uh, over an 18-month consultative process um, from that began back in 2018. It included um, policymakers, practitioners, as well as researchers, uh, not just based in headquarters, but in, in, in organizations as well as in countries, um, as well as um, government partners. 
it re it included a, a literature review process um, as well as a review of multiple types of documents, whether they were practice documents or guidance documents. And that's just to give a little bit of a background. The purpose of the standards um, and indicators was to establish a common language among stakeholders to define community engagement principles, as well as key actions, goals, and benchmarks. So there are some global principles um, within the community engagement minimum standards, and it's important for us just to set the stage um, and they are centered around four uh, core principles, quality, accountability, harmonization, and optimization. And what do we mean by that? So it's really important for us to remember that community engagement is a process as well as an outcome. So achieving quality at scale requires establishing common criteria, benchmarks, as well as actions, because there have been and still are a wide variety of approaches and interpretations in what constitutes quality. So establishing that there are what, what are those processes and what are the intended outcomes is very critical for us to say that we can achieve quality. When we think about um, harmonization, th this is another challenge between uh, implementing organizations that all have different mandates, whether we're thinking about government or other types of implementing agencies that work with governments. Um, it's very important for us to establish um, institutional standards and guidelines for community engagement, which align with mandates and missions of different organizations. Then when we think about um, harmonization, uh, sorry, accountability, um, in the case of accountability, um, in the case of community engagement, accountability demands that those that are responsible for community engagement approaches are fulfilling this responsibility through transparency in their design processes, um, implementation, as well as evaluation. So this raises the bar in terms of demonstrating the value of community engagement within these processes. And finally, um, the, the last principle that I'll talk about is optimization. More isn't always better. And um, it, there have been concerns over the effectiveness of development and humanitarian practice. And there, this led to a call for greater accountability between the multiple organizations to coordinate better and to harmonize um, what they do together. So it's really important for us to just consider for a minute and mention that during the development of the community engagement minimum standards, there were the, the document itself as a, as a product, there were many efforts that we made to align during the literature review with the existing global narrative, normative frameworks um, that are existing out there. So this is just to mention a few of them that were reviewed, and it provides an overview of those key frameworks that were reviewed and considered during the development of the community engagement minimum standards. The community engagement minimum quality standards and indicators um, are organized basically into four sections and cover 16 core indicators. We're going to speak about every part in the next few slides, but just to say that all four parts together are meant to ensure that the role of community engagement um, looks uh, holistically at empowering communities, community leaders, community organizations, as well as um, the, the service delivery part of it of government development and humanitarian initiatives that affect them. Um, it addresses the needs for harmonization and optimization of interventions that we spoke about in the, uh, the core principles, as well as ownership and leadership roles that should be taken on by community, as well as strengthening um, social accountability and institutional mechanisms um, or within humanitarian context, the different types of mechanisms that ensure that communities are engaged in responses. So part A um, are the core community engagement standards. Uh, this part is essential um, as it is the most fundamental section of the community engagement standards. It, in essence, what it presents, it, it reinforces criteria and key actions um, that should be ensured and integrated within policies and procedures and put in into mechanisms that are in place to ensure these six core standards. 
Um, I think it's really important for us when we're framing this in the work that we do is to, to think about some of the questions that we can ask ourselves um, to ensure that what we are doing put in pro put processes in place. Um, how do we define the marginalized groups, um, the underrepresented, the disadvantaged, etc.? So what is the applicability within the context of the programs that we work on and that we develop? Um, and so in each one of these uh, following slides that are describing each of the, the parts, what I aim to do is to propose some of the questions that are framed around some of the actions that we propose within the each one of these standards. Um, and I think it would be very useful for all of you while you're thinking about um, designing your programs as well as in this learning package and working on some of the exercises to think about some of these questions and apply them within the context that you work in and within the programs that you developed. We're going to talk about um, part B of the standards, which are the standards that support implementation. These standards are specifically uh, um, aligned to project cycle, basically, um, and how we think about project design, uh, participatory planning within the entire process, managing activities, as well as monitoring and evaluation. It really aims to ensure that we're considering contextual analysis, um, that we are conducting community mapping exercises, um, that we're thinking about how this is designed within, um, how this informs the overall design of a new activity or action or program. Um, so I think it's very important to say that it really considers how to ideally engage leadership um, and representation within the communities. And again, um, as, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm sharing um, some questions that can help us to frame the application of these standards uh, when we're thinking about new initiatives. Part C talks about the standards supporting coordination and integration. This section is very critical because what it actually references is the enabling environment for better harmonization across community engagement initiatives. Because as we know, um, multiple ministries and multiple partners um, work on community engagement initiatives uh, within a country context, within a regional context. There are many partners with many with many mandates, et cetera. So it's really important within um, this part C, what it captures is to really understand um, who is leading community engagement actions. Where are, um, where are the partnerships that we need to either strengthen or build? Um, and how do we better institutionalize and integrate community engagement efforts and make sure that they are aligned with existing national policies, um, strategies, or other approaches that are existing? Um, and so I really think that while we say part A is the fundamental part of the community engagement minimum standards because it puts this, the basis for how we engage community or what we want to achieve when we're um, um, designing community engagement interventions, part B um, talk about the program design and part C starts to talk about accountability, who is leading um, how do we ensure that different partners that support that are coordinating? And how do we ensure that integration is consistent with national policies and strategies? Part D focuses on the standards that support resource mobilization. And these standards are critical because if we don't think about um, management and administrative functions to support community engagement, community engagement won't happen. So in that consideration, are we understanding what are the human resource requirements? Um, do we have those human resource requirements? Um, do we have the financial resources that enable us to, del to deliver these interventions effectively? And these are very critical, therefore, for the operationalization of any of our community engagement interventions. So now we'll talk about the community engagement indicators and the guidelines for use. Uh, in the document itself, you have access to uh, 
the complete set of indicators. What I will just attempt to do is to present just a snapshot of these indicators um, and the guidelines for use. Um, so in the first set, which is in table three, um, the first set of indicators are focused on national and local governments and organizations that would support them. Um, and in the second set, which is uh, represented in table four, um, it's intended for NGOs, CSOs, and other implementing agencies that function and work at the community-based level. So table three and four are all divided into the four sections of the standards that I previously presented, where we have the core standards, the implementation standards, the coordination and integration standards, as well as the resource mobilization standards. So part A, B, C, and D, there are indicators for each of the 16 standards across those four parts. Um, we also proposed a methodology to score the indicators. Um, and there was a specific simplified scale developed which prioritizes progress towards achieving the enabling environment for community engagement practice by being able to um, uh, have values that range from five to one in terms of achievement on a Likert scale. Um, the objective of the numeric scale is to provide a broad progress um, uh, to measure change and achievements of the benchmarks over time. And in the subsequent slides, um, which are slides 16, 17, and 18, uh, what I have shared are just a snapshot of um, sample indicators for each one of the standards for Part A, um, just looking at what we have proposed for national and local government, and this is just one sample indicator for each of the six standards. Um, so we can just pause for a minute and take a look at the national and local government um, proposed sample indicators, and then NGOs and CSOs, and what the sample indicators also look like. And this is just one as well. And then maybe just worth mentioning is the last slide, um, which is slide 18, which is an open framework for community engagement measurement. And this is unique um, because what we also try to do is a flexible design um, or, or tool um, that can help for the development of indicators um, by presenting it uh, on an indicator matrix. It cross sections the core standards, which were in part A, against the other standards, which were in parts B, C, and D, which have mainly to do with implementation and operationalization. So users can use this matrix and develop it. Um, it's, it's a bit more flexible to think adaptively and think about how they would like to develop local indicators in ways that ensure that each of the core standards in part A are applied across implementation, coordination, and resource mobilization decisions and processes and outcomes over time. So this is a much more open structure for developing more um, community-specific uh, indicators that, that are, are a bit more specific and maybe less standardized. In this last section um, of this presentation, we're going to be talking about the community engagement minimum standards and their integration within health systems. So why the engagement of systems? Um, and, and I mean, what we're talking specifically about right now is health systems, but there are also other social uh, sector systems that are critical within uh, public health emergencies in particular, but in um, normal development programming uh, of public health sector. So um, within having a focus on strengthening systems uh, and capacities and approaches of government and civil society, and formal community-based structures and networks, academic and professional organizations, there are multiple organizations that are involved in these processes. Um, it's really important that we ensure that we focus on strengthening capacities of these multiple stakeholders and ensuring that at the end of the day, community engagement and social behavior change outcomes contribute to strengthening the system and also ensuring their resilience. And within um, these uh, core components of engaging the system, again, we, we bring up the issue around institutionalization. 
to ensure that um, community engagement and social behavior change approaches and outcomes are integrated within national programs. Um, also, the other uh, area that is critical to, uh, which is a critical component of this when we're thinking about systems building, is that engagement of communities uh, to prevent and control health risk are focused on ensuring that these processes are integrated across planning, implementation, monitoring, all cycles so that we're able to divert resources and ensure that local priorities are represented and these needs are identified. And also there is a plan over time to ensure that um, prevention and control of health risks are managed, not just during a crisis, but before that. Um, and also another component of why we focus at the systems level is ec equity um, and, and equity to through access and continuity of health services is not just during an emergency response. This is a core issue even in our normal development programs. So ensuring that um, s services are responsive to the needs and the priorities of the most marginalized and the vulnerable and the underserved, then we have a, a good understanding around what these challenges are, what the barriers, what the bottlenecks are, will enable us to ensure that there will be continuity of services as well as equitable access, not just during crisis, but also during development programming. And finally, ensuring that we focus on on strengthening capacities at the multiple levels, um, but particularly at the most local and community level and investing resources into building the systems around that, whether they are governance structures uh, or, uh, or government structures or community structures. This makes us uh, come to the question of why community engagement and social behavior change system strengthening within health sector and PHE. And so um, just to make sure that we're um, conceptually on the same page, um, we're not creating a, a new uh, concept or approach um, what, by, when we're talking about community engagement, social behavior change, system strengthening, but we're actually talking about the health systems strengthening approach and how community engagement and social behavior change becomes integrated within the sectoral approaches, whether in development or during emergencies. So what we've been talking about since the beginning of this presentation and presenting community engagement minimum standards is what we want to be looking at is being able to measure progress towards achieving an enabling environment for successful community engagement practice over time. Essential to that and part of the global principles that we spoke about for the community engagement minimum standards is accountability. And so around that, um, this all helps us when we um, integrate community engagement, social behavior change within system strengthening of the sector. Um, it helps us to develop our advocacy agenda and be clear about the role of the duty bearers in particular here and the decision makers when we're thinking about service delivery, um, responses, et cetera. It also enables us to ensure a resilience agenda, the, the resilience agenda or met progressing towards a resilience agenda in ensuring continuity and equitable access to services over time. Um, and then finally, um, also to be able to be adaptive and agile and flexible in, in the implementation of national as well as subnational efforts and being able to ensure that we do not duplicate efforts as well as resources. So it's really important when we're thinking about this um, that we, we focus on what sectors have in place and where are the opportunities for integration of community engagement and social behavior change. So this isn't just about doing orientations and briefings. This is about systemic engagement and ensuring that um, we take sy sy systemic pro um, steps to ensuring that we engage with the system through management structures, through um, the data systems, through uh, implementation of processes to deliver quality services. 
because it is through um, taking systematic approaches. For example, we can talk about capacity development, making sure that um, capacity needs assessments are implemented within a timely manner for um, the respect of human resources within a health sector to ensure that when we're talking about community engagement and social behavior change programming, that we are working with the right cadres. Um, from management to senior decision, making levels down to the frontline levels. And that's just one example. So I'm not going to read through um, the slides, but this is talking about the entry points and the, the opportunities for integration between the community engagement, a social behavior change um, components, into the normal health systems. Slide two, uh, the slide 22 um, aims to further go a little bit deeper and then actually um, maps out the community engagement minimum standards. Um, if we're thinking about it from a health systems approach, what would that actually look like? So um, as you might all be familiar with the health system strengthening components um, of leadership and governance, human resources, information management, health financing, as well as service delivery, um, what we aim to do here is to propose what would be some of the integration actions for the health system if we were to integrate community engagement, social behavior change within every single health system pillar. And then going further to that, um, when we think about the community engagement minimum standards and what the standards propose for every single one of those standards are actions. So if we map out the standards for every single one of these pillars, we can see that the community engagement minimum standards actually very much align with health systems actions and the proposed actions that we can think about from uh, a health systems perspective. Um, I know that this is probably a lot um, to take in, but it is the efforts for us to think about um, a health systems framing and how to integrate community engagement, social behavior change actions systemically um, within institutional processes um, and to ensure that uh, there are critical actions that then can be identified, planned, implemented, resourced over time. So to bring this all into um, some kind of application, we thought that we would take the current example of the COVID-19 response, um, just as one key example. And I think that most are probably aware because we're all affected by um, COVID-19 at the moment and it still continues. But uh, one of the approaches that has evol evolved over time, um, we've been talking about community engagement. Oftentimes we say community engagement and social mobilization during public health emergencies. Um, but in this COVID response, um, we have been referring to risk communication and community engagement. And on this slide, what we look at are the core components of risk communication and community engagement. And as we can see, um, these are very much aligned also with a health systems approach, where we start with social science and evidence to uh, help us to generate uh, the evidence and understanding uh, of what's happening at community level. Uh, we look at political, social uh, context and, and drivers and, and triggers and barriers around behaviors, et cetera. Um, and we are also taking into account um, participatory engagement processes. And during COVID-19, we know that we were very challenged um, with direct engagement at a community level. Um, but again, building on trusted networks and platforms and partnerships that were already existing. Um, also, we looked at better coordination. So when uh, we talked about the community engagement minimum standards in, in, in um, optimizing our interventions, harmonizing our efforts, um, of course, all of this is with government leadership and um, implementing partners that support government to drive that, as well as then civil society that's engaging, that is existing in every context. Um, and then the efforts around capacity building and where resources are getting channeled um, at a local level, but also at implementing partner level. 
And finally, um, ensuring this cycle of community feedback and rumor tracking. And this was the approach that, that was developed um, around the COVID response um, and prioritized to ensure that we could have a more people-centered approach. The key interventions I, I would probably summarize um, around RCCE was to build um, and strengthen trust over time. Um, realizing that building trust is a long-term and dynamic process, it's a relationship. Um, so understanding dimensions of power, influence, authority, and relationships um, to ensure behavior change or social change, um, it's really important for us to really understand who uh, do we work with more critically, uh, how do we do that, um, and the multiple sectors that are involved. Um, so I mentioned just the health sector, um, just and the health systems um, strengthening approach, but um, there are other social sectors, particularly WASH, for example, um, or uh, local developments uh, when we're thinking particularly about community engagement. So it's really important that we think about that from a very holistic perspective when we're thinking about risk communication, community engagement, um, it's not only limited to the, health, the public health sector or health sector that is in a country. So, um, and this is in general some of the key interventions that we um, were working on during uh, the COVID response. So how do we move forward? Um, I think just to leave everybody with a few parting thoughts, having talked about um, the community, how we define community, um, the evolution of the community engagement minimum standards, and um, this being a very excellent step for us to really consider um, community engagement in a more systematic and standardized way, and then the application of community engagement through a sectoral uh, or systems approach and systems lens um, and what some of the key actions that uh, government can actually take, but it's also not just restric restricted to government. It is also applicable within the context of multiple actors within civil society. So in moving forward, I think, you know, some of the critical questions that we uh, need to consider um, is the opportunity for the uptake of community engagement standards within um, the institutions that we all respectively work within, whether they are a government institution or a civil society uh, partner that works in this um, space. But where are the opportunities to actually integrate the standards standards and take actions to implement them and, and recognize that this is an intentional and systematic and resource heavy process. Um, and how do we ensure prioritization of our actions and having a plan over time to implement these types of standards um, and, and indicators that are relevant? How do we better strengthen our coordination mechanisms is very critical. Um, within every country context, there are uh, localized processes. So how do we ensure that um, we are taking into account what is happening at, at a country level um, and, and looking at what are these processes that we can take to strengthen these coordination? Now, again, um, we can just refer back to um, the, the community engagement minimum standards that have those parts C and D that specifically look at coordination efforts, leadership efforts, as well as the resourcing efforts. Other key questions that I think that we really should consider as well are what key partnerships do we have in place? Are they the right partnerships? Or um, are we missing some strategic partnerships? And how do we start to work on that? Um, and then other questions that are a bit more general and broader is um, in, in ongoing uh, programs of support that are currently happening within countries, whether we want to talk about the COVID response and how it's implemented or other types of public health emergencies that are happening, um, uh, what collaborations need to be strengthened in order to deliver the objectives of these programs? And how can community engagement, social behavior change help to drive some of the outcomes um, that 
are challenged at the moment. Um, and over time, what does that mean after a response? And again, that brings us back to the cycle of what do we need to do from a preparedness perspective and what do we think about um, when we're building a resilience agenda. Um, and community engagement and social behavior change are critical for that full cycle um, to in, in order to essentially achieve social development outcomes as well as the SDG agenda. Um, as I uh, wind up this presentation, I'd like to just thank you for uh, your time and your attention and listening in um, about the importance of uh, community engagement. Um, one, in this presentation, we covered um, just understanding uh, how do we define and identify and construct an understanding around communities to um, where we have evolved into developing community engagement minimum standards in which uh, different institutions and stakeholders and actors within community engagement practice um, can utilize and apply um, to enhance quality uh, and coherence as well as um, the practice around community engagement. And maybe I think it's really important for us to remember the lesson that COVID-19 um, has taught us and is still teaching us um, that it is important that when we're thinking about community engagement, we think about it from a very systematic and intentional and resource intense uh, intervention that needs to be thought of um, very systematically. And I hope that uh, in the future, um, we think about community engagement minimum standards to be integrated within all social sectors um, with the resources that are required um, in order to achieve community engagement intentions. Um, as, as I mentioned early in the presentation, um, community engagement is not just the process, it is an outcome. Um, empowered communities, communities that have ownership, communities that have capacities are better able to um, take care of themselves and be ready for uh, future um, pandemics or otherwise and be better prepared. And by them being better prepared, so will the systems that work with them. We all have a role to play and um, I look forward to um, community engagement uh, becoming more uh, institutionalized across many organizations. Thank you.